couple of things before we begin. First, I'd like to comment on the opening two verses, which I'm sure you know, but bear at least acknowledging. First note is that Jesus sat down. This is how a rabbi talked. It's not a conversation as one walks along, but carries the weight of an important teaching. The word for seated is the same word from which we get cathedral, a seat of authority. The second thing it says is, and he began to teach. The word in Greek for began to teach carries with it the implication that this is what he has always taught us. The content here is consistent with what he has always said. It is what is called in grammar a plume perfect tense, which means it was what he taught in the past, it is what he teaches now, and it will always be what he teaches in the future. And the final note is that I want to make a few brief comments on verse 13 through the end of chapter 5, which immediately follows today's lesson. I want to do so because though they are divided into several lessons in our lectionary, these verses have an internal consistency that is often not apparent when we meet them divided. And I'll hold those comments to the end. It will be a natural flow. So, we have the Sermon on the Mount, probably one of the most recognizable passages in all of the New Testament. If I were to say, blessed are the poor in spirit, Blessed are those who mourn, blessed those who are meek. Without finishing the phrase, most, if not all of you here, would say, yeah, I know that. They're called the Beatitudes. So the first thing is to deal with these, uh, these sayings that they are simply a lesson in humility. And note that I said simply a lesson in humility, unless you think it would be that it's not a lesson in humility. First thing then to deal with is that it is not simply a lesson in humility. I believe that this is not a recommendation to adopt a humble stance, but rather it is a warning to drop all stances. It is, in short, I believe, when carefully considered, a recommendation to move on to the central point of Jesus' teachings, the central point of the gospel, that being to trust God in all that happens to you. Remember, and he began to teach, meaning that this is what he taught in the past, it is what he's teaching now, and it always will be what he teaches in the future. The world may say, you have been blessed because you or your family are rich, or you are blessed because you have more than enough, or you are blessed because you are strong or cunning, or victorious. But what Jesus says here runs so contrary to what the world teaches us, what we hope for ourselves, that it can only be advice to stop, it can only be advice to stop assuming that we know what stance is correct. All we're left with is faith. A faith that God is with us in all that happens to us. A faith in the gospel of forgiveness. A faith that through Jesus God raises the dead. Now, you might say that though Jesus might, may not have expected us to succeed in all these categories, that he is calling us to try. And I agree with that. I agree because in our trying, we come to understand our true position. We come to understand it definitively for ourselves. Because let's face it, it is in the knowledge of our failure when we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is only Christ, that we, in Christ we are saved, that the Beatitudes have done their job and the gospel has taken the day. So again, he began to teach, meaning this is what he taught in the past, what he teaches now, what he will always teach. So let me use myself as an example, always the best and safest. And let's use one of the subjects for clarity. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. I was taught that the phrase poor in spirit is to say that before God and before others, I take the stance of humility. I work for the kingdom of God and I work for my fellow human being, but I do so without expecting any reward or achieving any merit. 
In short, I do these things without saying, hey, look at me. That's poor in spirit. Humility. So let's say for the sake of argument that I am reasonably certain that I would never feel myself superior to anyone else or believe that God should somehow think I'm a little better than other people. Let's say for the sake of argument that I am reasonably certain that for the rest of my life I will be humble. You see the problem with this sort of thinking? First, it's in the phrase reasonably certain. Let's suppose that I am even a better person than I think I am. Let's suppose that I am always humble and never suffer the sin of pride or arrogance. Just what is the foundation of my humility? Perhaps it is only that I have never run into anything so well done that I have not wanted to claim it as my achievement. My dad told the story about a man who spent 40 years in selfless service to the church so one Sunday they gave him a medal for humility, and the next week they took it away from him for wearing it. <laughs> so perhaps my humility has been maintained because I have not had the opportunity to be jealous. Have you ever known anyone who seemed immune to a certain vice only to fall into it when the temptation was sufficient? The person who passes up the $5 bribe just to take the $5,000 one? The person who would never betray a friend until the day he thinks he was betrayed first, and on and on and on. I might just be humble until the day I die, but that is the second point. Maybe until the day I die. But how about if given an eternity, given forever to meet absolutely everybody, can I be sure that I will never be arrogant or prideful? or act like my spirit is just a little bit better than someone else's. And there, I believe, is the problem as God sees it. Given an eternity of eternities, can God let one supposed virtue or one known vice to get through? No. So we're back to it. Is Jesus calling us to trust a new way? Yes. But we must realize as well that in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus wants us to take an honest look at who we are. Do you remember the story of the tax collector in the temple? He beat his chest and said, God, I am nothing. And Jesus said, this one went home justified, went home right with God. When we stand before God and say, without you I am lost, I am poor in spirit. Then we are blessed. Then we can truly mourn. Then we can begin to handle the world with gentleness. Then we can truly thirst after what God wants. Having received mercy upon mercy, then we have something to share with others. Then we can finally begin to make peace based on the truth and not on our fantasies. Knowing the truth about self in relation to God, we are able to withstand the insults, the persecutions, the false accusations. And that is the blessing of the Beatitudes. But in the very next verse after our passage, to drive his point home, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything. Theologian Robert Capon, in his book, Parables of Grace, has said this. Consider the imagery. Salt seasons and salt preserves, but in any quantity it is not in itself edible, nourishing, or even pleasant. On the basis of Jesus' comparison, we are meant to understand that neither his messiahship nor his disciples witness to it, assuming they don't betray it with sugary substitutes, will be all that appetizing to the world. People simply do not come in droves to anyone who insists that the only way to win is to lose. Nevertheless, Jesus' teaching is exactly that salty. But if the salt of the earth becomes insipid, if a disciple of Jesus forgets that only losing wins and dying saves, and if the apostolic church forgets it, 
Where in the wide world of winners, drowning in the syrup of their own successes, will either the disciple or the church be able to recapture the saltiness of victory out of loss, of life, out of death? The answer is nowhere. And the sad, sad fact is that the church, both now and at far too many times in history, has found it far easier, easier to act as if it were selling the sugar of achievement rather than the salt of Jesus' passion and death. It will preach salvation for the successful, and high in the sky for all the winners who think they can walk into the final judgment and flash their passing report cards. Their every last bit of that is now and ever shall be pure born. Because nobody will ever have that kind of sugar to sweeten the last deal. And Jesus is going to present us all to the Father in the power of his resurrection, not in the power of our success. In spite of all that, Jesus' program remains firm. He saves the poor in spirit. He raises the dead, and only the dead. He rejoices more over those who know they are lost, the least, the little, than all the winners in the world. That alone is what that losing race of ours needs to hear. That alone is the salt that can take our lives and give them flavor forever. That alone. So it says, and he began to teach. Meaning that this is what he taught in the past, what he teaches now, what he always will teach. And if you don't believe it, look at the rest of that chapter. For now Jesus plays a game of escalation kind of a Russian roulette. At what point will you give up and say, Lord, I am poor in spirit? But watch, it's a game of truth and expectation. So do you really want to play with your soul before God? Jesus says, not one jot of the law will disappear until all has been accomplished. Jesus says, anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses the experts in the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, it has been said, do not murder, but I tell you, if you are angry at your brother, you are in the same condemnation. Jesus says, you have heard it said, you not, shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that even if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. Jesus says, anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fires of hell. By the end of this chapter, Jesus has raised the price of entering the kingdom so high that no one can enter. The law will be executed, there will be no exceptions, and no mistakes will be made. And he began to teach, meaning that this is what he taught in the past, what he teaches now, what he always will teach. Blessed are you who realize your foreign spirit. Blessed are you when you mourn for all that you have done wrong. Blessed are you when you are meek, and know your rightful place before God. Blessed are you when you receive God's gifts with humility. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for what God wants. Great will be your reward in heaven when people persecute you and slander you for telling this truth. And he began to teach. It's a salty message. One the world needs to hear. Go and share it. Amen.